We are, are so excited to have our next panel here. Let's invite up our, our final panel, uh, and Uma is going to, uh, to moderate this, this panel for us. Uma is here with us uh, with the, the New Pluralist. I'll let her perhaps tell a little more about the New Pluralist, and, uh, and, and, but they're a, a large funder collaborative supporting lots of the work of the organizations in the room today. I have to say um, how much I, I love this name. W one of the problems underpinning polarization is what we forgotten that one of America's founding principles is this concept of pluralism. This idea that people with very different backgrounds and preferences can peacefully coexist. We're grateful to Uma for her support of the initiative and for the excellent work that they're doing. We're also joined by Ron Gunsberger, the CEO of StoryCorps, which does remarkable work to help people from different backgrounds and political beliefs um, sit down with each other and tell their stories. Ron's also an alumnus of our friend, former governor, Larry Hogan. Uh, we have with us as well uh, Layla uh, Zadine. I may pronounce that wrong. Did I get it right? Okay. CEO of the Millennial Action Project, which puts, puts this idea of highlighting commonalities into practice by helping legislators across the country bond over their youth rather than their political identities. And finally, we have Andrew Hanauer from the One America Movement, which does something similar but with faith communities. So please join me in welcoming all four of them. Thanks, you guys. So I just want to also start off actually picking up where Rachel left off in that message of courage. Um, and actually the courage it took for you, Governor Cox, to actually have this be your initiative and for NGA for actually standing, you know, in, as we face these tides, as what we face what can feel seemingly insurmountable right now, these waves, these floods, these threats that we're grappling with. What are we actually standing for? What are we standing up for? And this is really where the idea of pluralism comes in for us. These principles, these ideas, what is it that feels so foundational to our democracy that actually needs to go hand in hand with our democracy? And I think we see expressions of this in so many of the great field partners that are sitting right now in this room and so many more beyond that. So as the executive director of New Pluralist, I have the privilege of getting to know so many incredible people that are doing work on so many different levels. You know, I think a lot of times we think of the individual level interventions that need to exist, these deep immersive experiences of exchange but also thinking about people who are embedded within and inside institutions like you all, where using these platforms, using these voices, there is something greater that can happen when we come together. Um, and so that's why New Pluralist has been set up as a collaborative, a funder and field collaborative to advance pluralism in our society. Um, so I'm gonna start off by just describing a little bit more about what we do and then actually turn it over to this incredible panel which I'll be moderating with a number of the very leaders that I'm, I'm describing. Um, so we describe pluralism according to five principles that we think are absolutely foundational to the thriving of our democracy, the future of our democracy. So the first is to honor human dignity, no matter what. No matter what somebody believes, where they come from, there is something inherently worthy and dignified in a human what does that look like to be able to design our relationships, design our institutions, design our practices in such a way that we can honor human dignity? The second is to take responsibility for repair. That as a diverse, multiracial, multi-faith and growing in our diversity, we are going to harm each other. That's just simply what's going to happen. But do we have the capacity and do we have the will to be able to take responsibility to repair our relationships again and again. That is what it means to be part of a thriving, diverse democracy. And the third is to be able to expand our circle of care, right? And this is what we saw, especially in this opening panel. How do we stretch the bounds, the, the bridges that we're willing to forge with people who are not just a little bit like us, but really quite dramatically different from us? The fourth is to find strength in our difference. That our diversity is not just something we have to manage around, the diversity of perspectives and beliefs, but actually we come up with better solutions when we do this. And in fact, we need each other now more than ever. As we look at these looming crises, how are we going to be able to navigate these, all of these without each other? And the fifth is to move into greater sum thinking. Move towards an abundance mindset. Move beyond the zero sum that gets us locked into conflict with each other. 
And so new pluralists exist to advance these in culture. Yes, government, democracy, democratic institutions are a part of that, but we also look at the stories that we tell ourselves. We look at the ways in which communities are living into or not these different principles and practices, and we're here to discover, to come together, to make sense of what is all of this incredible work and possibility, and how can it start to reach greater and greater scales of impact. So we really start to shift and live and boost these as norms in our culture. And so with that, I am really excited to be able to introduce our panel where we're gonna be able to find out more about the work that you, you do, and in particular, to really start to highlight what is it that you are doing with the people that you're working with that enables other identities to start to kind of take the forefront, other identities to start to become more salient than just our, our partisan identities. So I'll just kind of work through and then, and then give you all space to talk about your work. Um, so I'm gonna start with you, Andy. Um, so Andy runs One America Movement, um, which is working with specifically with faith communities to be able to tackle toxic polarization. And then we have Layla, who runs Millennial Action Project, um, working with um, elected officials, but specifically young electeds, to be able to use youth as an identity that can supersede partisan identities. Um, and then Ron from StoryCorps, who's actually gonna be talking about the power of storytelling as a methodology, as an approach to be able to make other identities more salient as, as well. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Andy, maybe just kick us off and take a couple of minutes and describe what you do, what your organization does, but also really honing in on this question. Yeah, thanks, Uma, appreciate it. I thought the sitting here I would get to go last, so I was strategic, <laughs> but that, that didn't work out so well. Uh, it's great to be with you all. I wanna start actually just quickly telling you what every single conversation I have with an Uber driver sounds like. So I get in the car, they say, what brings you to fill in the city? I say, well, I'm here for work. They say, what do you do for work? I say, I'm trying to make the country less divided. And they say, good luck with that. <laughs> um, and then they tell me why they think the country is divided. And this will shock you. The answer is it is the fault of every single person in the country except for them. Mm. So, so we're, all, we're so quick to talk about the media, the, the politicians, the other party, the extremists on our own side, the moderates on our own side, and all of those things are, are, are uh, rooted in some fact, but the reality is the one thing that we often don't wanna do is look at ourselves. And at, at One America, our belief is that toxic polarization is in fact a spiritual crisis. It is not just a question of what kind of country are we gonna live in, it's also a question of who am I gonna be as a person. So in the work that we do, we really believe the faith community has an obligation, a responsibility, and an opportunity to be a light in the country and to respond to what we think of as a spiritual crisis. Um, we, we talk about identities that are salient, that are not political. Well, imagine an identity that is outside of partisan politics, that in fact transcends partisan politics, and, and actually is, is embedded in a set of norms and values and traditions and beliefs that help us respond to the toxic polarization in our country. So when we work with faith leaders, we're, we're helping them do the fundamental thing that they are feeling as a, as a pain point, which is people putting their faith identity first and their partisan identity below that. They tell us that they see a lot of people who come to church who used to say, well, I'm a Christian, I just happen to be a Democrat or a Republican, and now they say, I'm a Democrat or Republican, I just happen to go to church once in a while. And that flipping of that identity order is really critical to the work that we're trying to do to help faith leaders and faith communities address that. So more on that later, but grateful to be here. Great. Um, well, I wanna pick up on something that you just said, which is this idea that it's everybody else's fault but our own. And um, as, as Uma mentioned, as Governor Cox mentioned, I uh, run Millennial Action Project, which is the nation's largest cross-partisan network of young elected officials. And my job is to help them build relationships and bridge divides so that political polarization is not an obstacle to solving our country's biggest problems. And if you know a Gen Z person or a millennial person, one thing you know about them is that they're right and they believe in themselves and they feel like they are um, empowered, right, to, to, to be the owner of, of their life. And so what we do is channel that into our political institutions, people who are not only just Gen Z and, and millennials, but who have decided to step into public service to solve problems, who feel like they can do something to fix the problem and who want 
to get to the bottom of, of what those barriers are that are preventing progress. And so by connecting these young, incredible leaders, and we've worked with 1,600 young elected officials since we were founded, we're in 33 states and Congress, um, by connecting them along a generational identity and not a partisan identity, you introduce this really interesting cross-section of perspectives, people who are young and represent a rural district or are young and a Democrat. And by mixing all of that together can put people at the table to start having conversations um, about that future that they wanna build and not actually starting from um, I'm on the left and you're on the right and we have to end up at some sort of watered down middle compromise. And so sort of this dimension of youth for us has been a really exciting organizing tactic. Um, we help young Democrats, young Republicans stand up something called a future caucus in their state legislatures. Um, many of the, the governors um, here today have a future caucus in, in your state. And um, they have been able to build a permission structure for other young elected leaders to become friends with people across the aisle, uh, to start identifying policy opportunities. Honestly, sometimes just to complain about not even the other party, but like people in their own party, sometimes like a safe space for, for that. And uh, to create this vehicle that enables these young public servants to imagine what they can bring to the American experiment, to the endeavor of solving problems for the greater good, um, to bring that abundance mindset, Uma, that you mentioned to policy making, um, to create that permission structure has been really, really powerful. And we can talk a little bit about some of the um, results that we've seen from that, but that's, that's a little bit more about what we do. And I'm with StoryCorps. We're a nonprofit that's been around for 20 years. We believe in the concept that everyone has a story within them. And for 20 years, what we did was bring two people together who know each other and to record an oral history of the lives of one of them. It's a feature on NPR's uh, All Things Considered every Friday, for example. And also, all these recordings go into the American Folkways collection at the Library of Congress. To date, it's almost 700,000 voices collected. Um, it's the largest collection ever of human voices ever assembled. And a few years ago, we decided to kind of flip it on its head. So instead of going from two people who know each other having a conversation, we wanted to see if the power of storytelling of their lives could transcend perhaps what we're dealing with today. And so the idea came to try, we've been hearing a lot about contact theory today, and that's what this is too, about doing direct interventions, about bringing a conservative and a liberal together and to have a conversation not about politics, but about their lives, and to try to find and see the humanity in each other. And it's a great concept. We, we have four model cities that we use as our laboratory, if you want to call it that. More in common, we heard from Kate this morning, more in common fund studies of our work that Dr. Jen Richardson at Yale, who's probably this country's leading expert on contact theory, has been doing the study on, uh, on these interventions and how they work. And before I get to what she's found on them, what I want to show you is we queued up one, I just picked one regular one. We make these audio cards. It's only an audio recording, but we make a little video of it. Michelle, if we can play the one little video, this is from one of the actual conversations, a little excerpt. I'm a single father. I have two children. I actually grew up in Griffin's Balding County. If you're born in that county, you have like a 16% chance of getting out of poverty. So I'm like the 16%. Mm -hmm. And I tell that to my children, there's no excuses. It comes from within. And something that I also convey to my children, my parents grew up with nothing. My mom didn't have shoes, didn't have food, that kind of thing. And, you know, she's the one kid that put herself through college as a single parent. Yeah. When you think about the future, uh, what are you most scared of? I am just really nervous for my kids, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like right now, everything is just mean and nasty. But instead of reacting with kindness or yeah. compassion, people are quick to react with, yeah. I guess, hate, hate or anger, and not just like me and you're doing it, sitting here talking and trying to understand yeah. perspectives. Is there one thing that you respect about the way that I see the world? No. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I think 
you said that you want the best for this country. I respect that view, and I agree with that view. Okay. Is there anything that you respect that I said today? That you're a hardworking single father that wants what's best for his children, and I think that that's commendable and common between you and I for sure. So. Thank you. And with this program, sitting people down in these conversations, and like I said, we do it with our four model cities, we do it with our hub radio stations and public radio around the country that from time to time shift different communities. We bring people together for these conversations. And that last one was a good illustration because we're not trying to make people change their minds, we're trying them to see the humanity in each other. And the one fascinating thing so far, which always comes as a surprise to people, is it's not unexpected that when you sit across from someone, it's hard to hate up close, you come away liking the person you sat with and had the conversation, and they go away largely as new friends. What Dr. Richardson's study is showing us now that's interesting is statistically significant, she's seeing in her data, because she does before and after and then follow-up surveys, is conservatives are showing empathy for the other side as a whole as a follow-up. We're not seeing it the other direction yet, um, not statistically significant. We're seeing a small amount, but not the same. And for the fascinating discussion, the reason seems to be how each group defines themselves going in. And someone on the liberal side, for example, believes healthcare is very important and gun violence is very important. And if you don't agree with them on these issues, you're still just wrong. And a conservative often defines themselves, and I'm talking self-definition, as a patriot. And if they can see the person sitting across from them, that's why I picked that last video, as someone who wants a better country, even if they disagree with them on everything, they think they're still a good person, they're just wrong. And I think that's why we're seeing that so far, but it's heartening because when one side moves, the other side can move over time too, and I think it takes these interventions, these small interventions, to at least of the storytelling of their lives to get us closer together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if you have anything you want to add. I mean, I can. I think one of the things that I appreciate, even just, and I, I appreciate this again and again when I come across all this incredible work, is it's playing at every different, every level of scale. Like what you're describing is talking about individual to individual and how important and powerful that can be. I think, particularly when we think about these massive systems and cultural forces that we're up against, it can feel like that person to person interaction, like, well, what is that really going to do? It's just a drop in the bucket. And it really does matter. And at the same time, thinking about whole communities, whole communities that have certain norms and beliefs, I'm thinking about your work, Andy, in particular, that are getting lost. Or I mean, we're thinking about the decline in, in religious institutions and membership in there. There's a pain point. There's something that's actually really potent and powerful, where yes, it's about the individual faith leaders that you're working with, but it's also about those entire institutions. And then Layla, I think about with, with your work, and it's looking at the entire, I mean, it's the future of democracy. It's the future of these very systems that you're really describing and working on. And so the idea that in all of those cases, we're actually working with that very human, relational, cultural dimension, but the ways in which that can play out and be influenced is, is so different. Um, so I'd actually really love to kind of dig into that a little bit more, both the, like, the particularities of the communities that you're grappling with or the sectors or the ways that you're even thinking about the people, and where do you see the opportunities right now, but also where do you see resistance, and what are you doing about that? And if there's any specific mm -hmm. stories that might help illustrate that, that might be helpful. Um, so I don't know if you just pick who, who goes first. Well, I guess I have to go first. Yeah. This is apparently the, the chair for the person who goes first. Um, <laughs> no, so it's a great question, Uman. I think for us, the, the obstacle is that pastors and faith leaders, rabbis, are tired. They're exhausted. Mm. They have spent the last few years doing Zoom funerals, Zoom weddings. They have had political divisions tear apart their congregations. 42% of Christian pastors have considered quitting in the last few years. So, you know, when we think about any institution in American society that we need to be healthy, corporations, government, elected officials, faith is one of them. Mm -hmm. And right now, the institution of faith in America is most threatened by the exhaustion and the burnout among its leadership. 
And the reasons they cite for that burnout are largely around the isolation and loneliness they feel because of the divisions within their community. These aren't just, you know, I hate this guy on TV. This is the person I've prayed with for the last 20 years suddenly thinks I am the enemy. So that's the obstacle. The opportunity is that a lot of faith leaders, I think, are, are waking up to this for the first time. They thought, if I just stay out of politics, I'll be okay. Or if I just pick a side, I'll be all right. Or uh, they have uh, thought, well, after 2020, it'll just go away and it'll be fine. And that, that's not a strategy, right? So they're starting to see now, I think, that they have an important voice that if they don't put their voice out there, that vacuum will be filled. As one pastor put it, I get my people for an hour a week on Sunday if I'm lucky. Cable news gets them every night. And so that's what they're up against. And so I think there's enormous opportunity in that they are, they are I think, the moral leaders we need in this moment. And I think with elected officials and with the work that Layla's doing, if faith leaders and elected officials are both displaying the kind of courage that Rachel talked about, I think we can get somewhere really cool. Mm -hmm. So out of all state legislators right now, one in six is a millennial or Gen Zer, which is less than in the, the broader society. So one in six uh, state lawmakers is a young person. Um, but last year, one third of all bipartisan bills enacted were authored by a young person. One third of all bipartisan bills last year were, were written by a young person. And so to me, that's the opportunity that we are seeing a generation of young people step into public service and they are overrepresented in their ability or their desire at least to work together to solve problems. And something is happening that is sort of squashing that out of them. And so the opportunity is how do we protect those effective instincts so that we might actually scale them until they're not counterculture, they are the culture. And you know, one, one story, um, in 2020, we launched the Oklahoma Future Caucus. And they spent about a year really just building relationships, getting to know each other, becoming, um, building that trust. And the following year, the Democratic co-chair of the Future Caucus, Senator Kerry Hicks, came to her Republican counterpart, and, you know, as we all know, the, the Oklahoma state legislature is uh, overwhelmingly red. So she's in the minority and she comes to him with this idea um, for a harm reduction bill for needle exchange, which is quite controversial. And she had to trust that uh, Rep. Daniel Pei would want to work on this with her, not want to water it down, would want to, as he said, he was going to take it and run it and try to build support among his party in order to collectively advance this idea that they thought would both really helped their communities. And what Rep. Pei was able to determine was that one in three uh, members of law enforcement suffered a needle stick injury in his or her career. And so he saw the value in this piece of legislation without changing it at all, was able to really build support as a law enforcement protection bill um, and although they were sort of coming at it from different angles, the, the content of that piece of legislation that they were able to work on together, they had different sacred values almost that they were protecting and advancing that, but the trust that they had built allowed them to have the conversation in the first place to write something that now has been signed into law and has already saved thousands of lives. And so I think you know, just the, the opportunity in, in seeing in young people building these relationships laying that foundation without a transactional end goal, goal in mind. You can't have, they didn't start building that relationship because they knew they wanted to pass this bill. They built it because it was the right thing to do. They wanted to build that, that coalition. The outcome can be transformative and have quite immediate impact. Now, I think the, the hard part, um, and we've heard a little bit about this already today, is you have to sustain that trust building and that engagement even when inevitably you are on opposite sides of, of an issue and you are going to disagree and you are going to have to stand up for what you believe in and that is different from, from maybe what the person on the other side of the aisle believes in. And despite that, that doesn't mean that the entire effort has been in vain or is worth dropping. Um, it means that it's actually working if you are able to hold that together. Um, and so you know we've seen in places, um, 
in places like Vermont, actually, at the end of last session, the Future Caucus was split on, on a bill, and um, the, future, the, the Vermont Future Caucus is one of the most impressive caucuses in the entire network. They, they allowed that to, to split them and then came back, have been meeting in the off session, have ideas for um, the 2024 session, have been um, you know, incredibly collegial, and I think being able to um, allow disagreement and to, to um, then continue on past that, it's, you know, it's not necessarily an obstacle, but it's something that has to be top of mind and something that we work through in order to sustain these, um, these broader strategies. Mm. And for us, for, for what's the plus is, I think we believe in the concept, at least we do, and I'm still the eternal optimist, that people are inherently good that there is that spark of goodness in everyone and that's what we're trying to tap into. Now, if you want the challenge, I'm gonna go a different direction, actually. The challenge is the ecosystem itself. And what I mean by that is each of us up here and all of you out there with the groups you represent, each believes we hold probably one of the key pieces to making this work. And the reality is we're all just pieces of the puzzle and there's no picture you can form unless we actually start becoming a real ecosystem that our first step feeds to another group for their second step and vice versa, because it's only when we start truly working together beyond basically at surface level that something's gonna happen. And what I mean by that is this. I think we're all allies and we all do work together, but there's something, and Kate from More In Common mentioned this morning, I think she called it the curse of nonprofits. And that every nonprofit has to work with their funders and they know what they need to do to keep the organization functioning. And they're afraid to get too closely intertwined, this is outside of bridging groups, with other similar groups because they're worried, well, what if they poach our funders? What about things like that? And if you want to get over that obstacle and to make all the groups work together, probably one of the keys is some of the overarching funding organizations need to start pushing things that require linking the groups together in the activities that they have to work together to make it more effective. Because without that, everyone's gonna wanna work together, but fear, being afraid of what happens to the funding sources will actually hold that back. So if you're asking for a challenge, that's the real challenge. And that's why I'm glad all of us are here in the room today. I'm hoping all of us break this afternoon later, have chances to talk to see if we can actually do more than even just this, that it becomes a dialogue and ways to work together. But you asked the challenge. The challenge is building an ecosystem and scaling up for a critical mass. While it's important, because to give the uh, Ronald Reagan line I always liked, is that freedom is a very fragile thing. And it's never more than one generation from extinction. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to keep in mind. It's something that has to be fought for and defended. And that's what every one of us, regardless of where you come from the spectrum, are from. It's what you believe in, and it's why we're here today. So that, mm. if you ask, that's my reasoning. That's a really, that's a really powerful thing. I mean, I think that's one of the most exciting things about actually seeing what is going on right now, too. The idea that we're actually all collecting here to be able to sort of surround sound, you all as governors, as you're grappling with what could this actually mean? How do we show up here? How do we show up together there? whose skills, whose tools, whose research, whose perspectives are gonna be most valuable. It, the better we get at that, I think the more likely it will be that we'll be able to affect culture change in this way. Um, I think some of the threads that I'm also pulling from what, what you were sharing too is, there's something about needing to speak to real pain points and the actual context in which people are grappling with really challenging issues. I think we heard that from the, the very personal sort of family issues that people are worrying about their kids. Mm -hmm. I know that I got to experience that even sitting at the dinner table yesterday, hearing about the concern that people have about the future for their kids. And how do we start to make this something where it's not a, like democracy's on fire, we have to fix it, because that's only gonna really appeal to some people. I think it really has to be like these are, the stakes are so high on everything that we care about as faith leaders, as people trying to move any sort of bill, how do we actually hold a bit of a transformational vision together too? Yeah, I, I, I think, I, I sort of call it the nonprofit savior industrial complex, which is this idea that 
You know, I, I have, we have 25 staff, and that makes us one of the largest nonprofits working on polarization, and that's not a good thing, first of all. But second of <laughs> all, it's, it, it's, it's a little hubristic to think that we're gonna save America mm -hmm. with our yeah. 25 staff, right? We need at least 30 for that. <laughs> so the question is then, what's the model? And for us, the model is we're here to serve a community of people, mm -hmm. right? We're here to serve faith leaders. We're here to serve faith communities so that they can put yeah. their moral, spiritual, physical resources to bear on the problem. And I think mm -hmm. that's what we need to be doing to, to really uh, stand up those pillars of society that already exist, that already are involved in people's lives, so that they can be as healthy as possible. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree, Andy. I think it's, it's about how do you um, give a man a, a fish eats for a day, teach a man to fish, right, eats for a lifetime. I think this idea of building the infrastructure to allow people to connect in ways that right now are being flattened into these superordinate partisan identities, that's what the end goal should be, and it is very hubristic to think that creating, you know, for me to say, oh, the solution is only young people should be elected officials and they'll fix it all. Like, <laughs> that's, that's, that's just creating weird, like, age warfare that's not gonna be helpful at all. So creating new groups just leaves us in the same position of still having them fighting between multiple groups. And so I think it's more about how do we enable a culture shift where people are able to, and, and Amanda Ripley says this all the time, complicate the narrative of who other people are to give people the tools and capacity to do that in lots of different situations. That's what we should all be, be working on. And I think there's a, a huge opportunity for us to continue working together um, to see that culture change. That, and as someone who worked on a lot of campaigns as a consultant over the years, we need to flip the current equation on its head that rewards bad behavior and punishes good behavior, especially in primaries, especially in very gerrymandered primary districts. What we need to do is get to a culture, and by creating a sea change that, that, that is significant, that starts to punish the bad behavior and reward the good behavior. We've seen a few examples. I, I, I would think, thing off the top of my head, Madison Cawthorn in North Carolina losing his primary last time to a, if you want to call it, a standard conservative candidate who just wasn't a bomb thrower. There are examples, they're rare, but there's a certain point when even the most zealous person on either side thinks something is just going too far and over the line. And I think, regardless of where we come from, just doing our bits to change that culture is a key thing that's gonna change it, because it does come from the top down. I think we emulate a lot of what we see from our leaders. And if we start to see those that misbehave actually be punished by the voters and replaced by better ones, we'll have a better country. Hmm. Can I add to that? I, that's right. And I think also people want something better. They, they don't look out at our politics and think, oh, this is great, right? This is, this is really working. And I think about how you all can model that, how faith leaders can model that. I think about when Governor Cox had protesters outside your home, right? And uh, he could have taken his family tank and rolled them over or whatever, but instead he went out and he baked them cookies. And I don't know if that's smart politically, I don't know if that's gonna win you elections, but that is, for me as a Christian, that is the Christian response. Mm -hmm. And I think no matter what people's religious views are, they are hungry for something that is different, that, that flips mm -hmm. the, the narrative on its head. When Jesus says, love your enemies, he's flipping thousands of years of human history on its head. Mm -hmm. Thousands of years, we killed our enemies. He's saying, no, no, not only do you love them, but here's a tactical step we're always talking about in this field, intervention, steps, programs. Here's one. Pray for people who you disagree with. Pray for your enemies. And when you do that, it changes the way that you look out at the world and the way that you see the people that you disagree with. What would be your, as, you're, as we're sitting here, kind of positioned where you are, what do you think is the unique opportunity for governors to be able to play that even connect to the communities that you work with as well? Well, mine's probably the, the most obvious. I think the um, question of, you know, people want to see a better way and like, is something smart politically or not smart politically? Being an effective policymaker is smart politically. Being able to go to your voters, go to your constituents and say, look what I got for you, that is very smart politically. And I think governors are well positioned 
to help celebrate when those bipartisan policy wins that are being led um, by, by members in the, in the state um, to really use the convening power that the governor has to celebrate that, to give lawmakers the effective policymaker stamp that they can go back and be rewarded with, get their you know, um, uh, press coverage. And I think that um, there's also sort of this human, you know, th sometimes I joke about making t-shirts that say, lawmakers are people too. Um, because we, we think about you all as like robots, as just like chess pieces. And actually there's a real human need for recognition and, and validation, I think governors to a young elected official to be able to invite them to the governor's mansion to celebrate something that they've done in a bipartisan way is incredibly meaningful. It might be the difference between do they just throw up their hands and say this toxic system is just too much, I don't want to be the in-group moderate anymore, it's not for me, I'm, I'm out. Mm -hmm. That could be the difference between them saying somebody's watching, some, somebody mm -hmm. cares, and I, you know, this is worth it. And so I just say, you know, if there's a future caucus in your state, if there's a young person who is maybe on the fence about running for office, just think about that next generation and how they can be part of creating a better and more healthy civic flywheel in the future for policymaking and um, reducing polarization. And, and jumping on what Layla said, having spent eight years with Governor Hogan, same idea. You guys have incredible accoutrements of power, and the governor's mansion is one of them, and inviting people to your office is one of them. And Use your power, your bully pulpit, to bring the bridging organizations together because you're the magnet that will draw them into that room if they even get a little bit of face time. That holds true for almost everyone. Bring them together in your state and basically empower them. Show your support for them. That It doesn't matter whether they come from the left or the right. If they're bridging organizations, help, help connect them to people. Help connect them to some of your own uh, supporters and funders. Help open doors for them so they can be more effective in your states. That, that is one of the best things to do because each of you might not be able to change the country as a whole, but you can help change things in your state. Yeah, I would just add, I think, I would love to see faith leaders having conversations with elected officials, not about are you gonna support the policies that I personally like, but about affirming you all when you take courageous steps to reduce the toxic divisions in the country. I think a lot of faith leaders would wanna do that and I think there's a way that you can use your convening power to make that happen. Great, thank you. All right, I think we're gonna open it up to your questions now. Governor Phil Murphy has a question. Thank you, Spencer. This is fascinating. Um, and, and let me say that I, I hail from the Federal Republic of New Jersey, so uh, we, we never bring a knife to a gunfight uh, as it relates to politics and discourse. It's more an observation, um, and, I, I, and, and it's as much for you all as it is perhaps for the prior panelists, and I know the clock is short, so it, it strikes me, we just, part of the reason we came up this morning is we were at the 9-11 memorial uh, uh, event that takes place every year at Ground Zero in New Jersey at over 700 losses of life. And you hear every, and they read out every single name, uh, including those that, whose lives were lost in the Pentagon and in Shanksville. And um, you hear a lot of faith in these stories. You hear their life story, and you have a lot of youth who are speaking, typically children or grandchildren, about a, a loved one. Um, and that was really striking. What was also striking is we all, the elected officials all stand inside of a pen in very close proximity, and you had in this tiny little area, you had on the one hand Kamala Harris, AOC, Ali Mayorkas, on the other hand you had George Pataki, Rudy Giuliani, and Ron DeSantis. And it got me thinking, particularly thinking about coming here today, and again, I don't know that there's data that would support this or not, but it seems to me in times of enormous crisis and tragedy, we, we are able, no matter who the leader is, no matter what party they're in, they're able to swing a huge amount of people to their side. Uh, and we sort of check uh, our partisan, typical, both our polling and our perceptions at the door. And, and folks, it, tr it transcends the normal period. So 9-11 would be the most horrific example of that in our lifetime. But the pandemic, regardless of how you played it, 
whether you, like I did, shut it down, or like Ron did in Florida and kept it open, everybody got the benefit of the doubt from the, from the broad middle. Storms are that way, natural disasters. And I just wonder, it's not a question as much as it is, I wonder if there's something there. God knows we don't need more tragedy and loss of life, but is there something that underpins that that we could learn from uh, in a sort of normal course of business time? Thank you. I'll just give you very quickly, we, we actually have a one small step program actually going on Capitol Hill for members of Congress. It's different because they know each other, but it's getting them talking again. And relating exactly to what you just said, one member of Congress, I'll just say a conservative Southerner, um, made the comment when I asked him after the conversation, did he have any hope that things would improve, at least in Washington, for being able just to work together again? And his answer was, honestly, I'm doubtful. He said, I think it literally takes another 9-11 or who knows, Mars invades us or something, he says, because I don't know how we put this behind us right now, it's just so bad. And he goes, and none of us wants it, and none of us can turn it off. And that's kind of discouraging to hear from leaders, but the fact that they're doing the conversations means some of them do want to change something, but it is very hard. I think without the crisis, it's hard to do, the evocation of patriotism doesn't work that we're all in together without the crisis, but God forbid we don't want to go down that road. I, I think one of the things that we're observing as well is that there's something about people actually taking action together. Like there's something about the real needs to, to your description. There's something that makes it so vivid when there is a crisis like that, that people are able to kind of get together. And you see this happening on a micro level within communities. There's somebody's roof falls in, especially in rural communities. You'll find that people will, it doesn't matter. You go, you help. I think the challenge comes, and then what? And I think that's when we start to see things sort of backslide into then what was the norm, where are we starting to kind of shift? And I think we have to think about how do we harness these opportunities to, c to kind of keep nudging us in a certain direction. Yeah. Thank can, you. Can I just add? Yeah, oh. please. I, I was just going to say, just because you brought it up, part of my personal story about why I do this work is my parents are immigrants from Morocco, and I grew up in the suburbs of New York and was just going into high school when 9-11 happened and feeling my Arab American identity and a deep sense of patriotism at once was an extremely confusing feeling mm -hmm. for a 13, 14 year old girl and to think about the systems and institutions that enable um, a country to stay safe and the deep sense of connection I felt to a country that you know, was being very, um, it, it was just, you know, scary time obviously to be, um, to be Arab. I think that has driven me to see the best in, as you described, sort of in this, in this moment of crisis, how people can come together. How do we, how do we make room for even more people? How do we enable mm -hmm. not to, for me, even going back to that moment is not actually desirable. How do we use this abundance mindset to think about what is the country we want to build that doesn't require a 9-11 or a Mars attack, and what opens our arms even wider to build this community of, of people who can um, see the humanity in each other and also, through our institutions, build a, an economy, a country, and a, you know, safety for, for all. Sadly, that is all the time we have. Uh, please give a round of applause for our amazing panel. Thank you so much. Right.